Um, thanks everyone for coming. It's um, <laughs> and staying to the last. It's 5 p.m. on a hot day, and we're in a hot room. And but we have fans. Uh, hopefully, this will be a fun way to end this uh, really great event. So, uh, the evolving architecture of the web. This is a very abstract kind of title. Uh, I'll get into what that means pretty soon. But it's about how the internet is changing. Uh, first. A little bit about myself, uh, I work on cryptography, cryptography related things at a company called Cloudflare. Uh, Cloudflare helps websites stay online and uh, helps keep them secure and protects them from DDoS and, and, and things like this. And not only websites, but web services, anything on the web. Uh, and what I work on is helping make the internet better for everybody. Uh, at least that's that's what I like to tell myself. <laughs> okay, so um, when I talk about the web in this presentation, I'm not going to be talking about front-end technologies like HTML or JavaScript or CSS or you know back-end technologies, Ruby on Rails or Docker or things like this. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the underlying infrastructure and protocols that web services are built on, connecting the dots. Um, and the web is only one of many applications that uses the internet. And uh, the internet is, you know, hundreds of thousands of networks all interconnected, speaking together. Um, but the web is a very important one. So it's one of the most important applications using the internet. And when we talk about the web, there's often uh, different goals, different things that you'd want the web to provide. And privacy is one of those high-level goals that people agree that the web should provide. And uh, ideally, in, in a perfect world, uh, the web browsing patterns of individuals are not accessible by third parties, and uh, especially the network entities that make up the internet. Um, another high-level goal of the web is performance. If you're browsing a website, it should be snappy, it should be fast, the latency between uh, when you send a request and when you get a response uh, should be low. Uh, historically, there's been a tension between these two goals. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, you can think of uh, going all the way to, on the privacy end, you can have uh, a network like Tor, which uh, provides really strong privacy guarantees, uh, but in exchange, you have very, very bad latency uh, type performance characteristics. So you're going around the world several times. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can have uh, sort of unencrypted, cacheable, uh, UDP, sort of one transaction, uh, different types of protocols that provide, you know, very, very fast performance, but privacy characteristics are, are pretty much uh, non-existent. Uh, so in, in this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is a confluence of events that have changed the architecture of the web in a way that makes it possible to improve both privacy and performance simultaneously. And uh, I'll be presenting a, a, a vision of some things that, that could be that are currently happening and uh, in the last six months even, this, this world has changed. Uh, so the two protocols I'll mostly be focusing on are HTTP and DNS. So two very old protocols and uh, two very fundamental ones to making the web possible. Um, HTTP is uh, a, a very simple query response protocol. It takes web addresses and returns web content. Uh, it's a two-party protocol between web client and a web server. Um, it's unencrypted and by default. What's the other one? DNS. DNS is also same sort of thing, a query-oriented protocol. DNS is like the phone book of the internet. It takes host names and returns IP addresses. Uh, DNS has a, a tiered structure, so you have a DNS resolver. Typically, your operating system talks to this DNS resolver and uh, resolves, if you will, uh, host names. Takes a host name and takes, gets an IP address back, whether it's IPv4 uh, or IPv6. DNS is used for transferring other things, but in the web context, this is typically what we're using for. Um, as one of the oldest protocols on the internet, it also wasn't built with privacy in mind or encryption or anything like that, so it's, it's a fully unencrypted protocol but it does have very well-defined caching semantics. So resolvers uh, know how long to keep messages, know how long they're fresh using uh, time to lives and, and things like this. But HTTP and DNS, they look very similar and they look really bad from a privacy perspective, uh, just, just plainly looking at who, what the internet, people on the internet can see as things go, things go by. So let's uh, visualize the early web in terms of uh, clients and hosts users and websites, if you will. And uh, because residential networks don't let you 
and host your own website. People tended to host their, their websites on uh, sort of a small set of networks that um, <coughs> allowed incoming requests. So um, you have this situation in the early web where you have uh, websites hosted in several sort of centralized locations and people connecting to them uh, from all across the world. So the latency characteristics are not very good um, because if your website's hosted in one, in one place, you do have to contend with the speed of light. It takes a while for bits to cross all the way across the world. And in doing so, they cross between many different uh, networks operated by different organizations and uh, it exposes traffic to multiple countries, uh, potentially. Um, so if there's a leak in the routing table, this, this traffic can end up going basically anywhere in the world. Um, now, if we focus more uh, exactly on what a network observer can see for, let's say, HTTP traffic, um, you can and as assume, in this case, that you have a client IP address and a server IP address. These are unique. Um, you also get a server the website's URL, so like the full content of what the web address is, and then the content of the website itself. So basically, uh, network observers can see almost everything that you're doing with, uh, with unencrypted HTTP. And focusing on, you know, if you have one client, one server, uh, the anonymity set, if you will, is, is one to one for each of these. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is the early web. There's only 4.3 or so billion uh, IPv4 addresses. And reality, this, this doesn't really scale to everybody. So um, there's been, there, there are certain ways that you can get around uh, this, this limitation and let everybody connect to the internet. If, if you count IoT devices and connected cars and phones and toasters, this number, it's, it's way more than 4.3 billion. And it's not evenly allocated. So um, one thing that has kind of happened is uh, the idea of a forward proxy. Uh, popular ones that you can think about this is, uh, is a NAT, a local NAT. So um, basically, you have these clients, and they connect to, the, to the, these websites through a proxy. And if your network observer is between the proxy and the website, they see mostly the same things, except rather than the client's actual IP, they see the proxy uh, IP. And so. Um, <coughs> There's different types of proxies. You can, I mentioned Tor earlier. This uh, has a really high latency cost. You have exit nodes. People kind of connect through Tor and then exit through that node and connect to the website. So very high latency cost. Uh, VPN can also be potentially once around the world. If your VPN's in one location, you have to connect to it and then connect to the website. Um, if you have a NAT, it can be sort of small. So uh, the focus of this talk is like, how can we make sure that the latency cost is low while also having the best potential privacy properties in terms of limiting what plain text and what decipherable things there are explicitly on the network. Um, and in, in this case, the client anonymity set is, is K, say. So those are all the people behind the proxy, and uh, one on the server. So this is just an illustration, right? This is just one side of the story. Uh, not everybody uses a proxy. Um, and th this, is, this is not something that's universally usable by everybody. But one thing that could be improved here is this, the server side of the operation. So let's explore how to improve this anonymity set for the server, for something that the, ne the network sees. Um, before we get to that, we have to explore some of the trends that have been happening on the web since in unencrypted HTTP and unencrypted DNS. Um, one of the two, the two major revolutions, really, are shared hosting and encryption. Uh, with HTTPS, this is, this is the secure version of HTTP, secure, um, content is encrypted. And this is a huge upgrade to privacy. Uh, it sort of looks like this. Um, your browser connects to the website, and the ISP no longer gets to cache static content. It has to go all the way to the host. And when you're first connecting, you have to have several round trips, one for TCP and at least two for establishing uh, the shared keys to, to send the con encrypted connection. So this is a, a, a big upgrade for privacy, but it doesn't necessarily uh, help with latency. Uh, if your host is halfway around the world, this is really going to slow things down. Uh, connections are going to require quite a few more round trips. 
So um, this is what it looks like with TLS 1.2. Um, a new version of TLS is about to be published next month or so, I think. Um, coming soon. So I've been saying that for years, but I think it, it really is coming soon now. Uh, I might have even mentioned this two years ago when I was here. But, uh, but it does cut one round trip off, off the connection. And it also has another positive effect in that the certificate used by the server to advertise to the client what website uh, the server is authoritative for um, no longer is sent in the clear. So uh, this is sort, sort of a very small change, but it'll come up later. Uh, so the, the, server's the server certificate is encrypted and there's one less round trip, um, which this has caused some sort of consternation and issues with things like TLS inspection middle boxes. But generally, this is a move towards a healthier protocol that has uh, a better chance of evolving over time. Uh, let, let's look back to what a network observer can see. These are slightly bolder lines, uh, not super helpful. but. Um, you have you know, a unique client IP and a unique server IP. Server URL is no longer visible, and the website content no longer visible. Um, so your anonymity set is still rather limited. You have clients and servers. If you see a, a flow, you know who's talking to who, to who. But just like in the client case, where your IPv4 set is limited, this caused people to have to do some sort of compromises, some sort of consolidation. And uh, in, in reality, um, we've moved from a situation where you have these hosts that are spread around the world and relatively uh, disjoint, administratively diverse, to a situation where there's a lot more of these centralized hosts that manage multiple different sites. And this is, this is a way that more people got online and more people were able to, to host websites. So when you say 4.3 uh, billion or so, there's maybe that many websites, but uh, in terms of number of web services out there, it's, it, it's quite high. You're, you're gonna be using up this space and anybody new uh, is, is unable to get fresh IPv4 addresses. So uh, you get in a situation where these hosts manage quite a lot. Um, and in a perfect world, if you were to say add encryption to this, then you could say, oh, there's you know, one IP for this giant host and everything's going to it. Your anonymity set is higher. You can't really tell which website you're going to, which is, which is unfortunately uh, not the case because um, the server needs to choose the certificate based on the first flight that the client sends. So the client has to say which, which website it's actually going to. In a world where each website has a unique IP address, you can infer that from the IP address, but if you're starting to consolidate something on the same IP address, the server needs to know which one you're talking about. So uh, in TLS, they added this extension called SNI, which is a server name indication, which basically just says, this is the host name that I'm trying to get trying to. Get to. Uh, and the server's like, okay, I'm virtually hosting a bunch of these servers behind. And uh, SNI is nearly universal now. This is, that's uh, somewhere last year or so. So we're at like 98, 99%. So um, browsers unencrypted in the first flight will send which website they're going to. So this is, this is a, uh, this is a pretty clear uh, signal. So looking at it from what a network observer can see again, you have the client unique IP, you have a shared server IP, but then you have the host name. So uh, the host name itself pretty much limits. If we're talking about person to website, this is one to one again. Um, there are some interesting secondary effects to this as well. Um, Several years ago, there were uh, internet scans were a really big thing. You take the entire IPv4 space and connect to every IP address and see what certificates are there. Um, you could kind of enumerate the entire internet that way. And uh, this, this doesn't work anymore with SNI. Um, if there are sites that are SNI only, uh, which because you know we're at such a really high adoption rate, a lot of sites are now. So you can't really scan the whole internet. And uh, IPv6 is a thing. It's still, you know, adoption's really slow. You can't really rely on the fact that IPv6 is out there. But IPv6 has a massive, massive space. So it could, you could definitely have a unique IP for every website in the future and not uh, enumerate through them all. So uh, there's, you know, like an, an alternate evolution of the internet in which NATs didn't need to exist or virtual hosting did, didn't need to exist. But uh, that, that's like IPv6 is adopted 10 years ago. We could be in that world. 
but we're not in that world. Um, so this is uh, maybe a, an interesting side effect, but uh, privacy kind of evolves in, in different ways. Uh, as of this month or so, certificate transparency, uh, it, which is a new, well, it's been around, been around for a while, but it's a, it's a new way to uh, keep track of the, the public key infrastructure uh, ecosystem. It, uh, there's a couple services, Google, Cloudflare, and a, and a few others, uh, run these Merkle trees that contain basically every trusted certificate in existence. And um, in order to have your website trusted by Chrome now, you have to actually have submitted to at least two of these uh, certificate transparency logs. So if you want to actually enumerate the internet, you can actually go through the certificate transparency logs and see what all the host names are and use those as SNIs. And, uh, and actually, you, you, this whole, this whole the internet scan disappearing thing, this was maybe a, a short-term thing, maybe two or three years in which you couldn't scan the whole internet. And uh, you lose some visibility because there's such, such a thing called a wildcard certificate where um, you have a certificate that covers a host name with the dot and then a star beside it. So you don't actually know all the host names, all the, the subdomains. But in any case, if you have an HTTPS site and you want to scan them all, certificate transparency will get you most of the way there. OK, that was just an aside. Let's go back to uh, improving this one-to-one -one anonymity set. See, let, let's see what else we can do. And there's been some interesting new advancements. Uh, one on the infrastructure side is uh, edge services. Uh, so edge services are these geographically distributed networks that act as the server for multiple web properties of, at, at once. They delegate to these uh, widely distributed networks the ability to terminate TLS. So uh, rather than connecting to a central website, you connect to a server that's very close to you and do the TLS handshake there. Um, these networks often use uh, any cast to reduce the need for having a different IP in every location around the world. Uh, this is this is a, a network network um, network technology, um, but this is also great for DDoS resilience. The, the internet right now is a pretty dangerous place. You can flood a lot of traffic at any individual point. So having a distributed networks helps keep things online. And um, yeah, this this is something that's become really cheap and really popular uh, in the last five years or so. And looking at how the internet looks right here, so the thick lines are HTTPS, uh, it, it's gone from looking something like this with some central, central sites to, um, to something like this, where you have uh, many, many, many websites are connected to these Anycast hosts. So when you're connecting to a website, for most of the time, you're actually not transiting the entire network. You're limiting the scope of, of how many networks have access to your cl uh, clear text traffic. So content's close to the user, fewer long lines, and it also helps out with uh, latency, right? So these extremely expensive connections no longer have to be as expensive. So it can help with latency, help with performance, uh, and these are some of the motivations for, for folks to be moving to these these edge services. So given that we have a completely different map of how the internet works and how the web is connected uh, topology-wise now than we did in the early days of the web, uh, the questions are, can we improve privacy? Can we improve latency? Can we, you know, ideal case, do both at once? Well, uh, I guess we have to get into the nitty-gritty details. I hate to do this so late into the day, 5.18 <laughs> or so. but. Um, but HTTP 1.1, this is the common version of HTTP. Um, the way it works is uh, you make a DNS query for the site you want to go to. For example, let's just say you want to go to burrito.com and beans.com. Uh, say beans.com are the images on burrito.com. So burrito.com, you get the IP address, and then you connect to burrito.com. Say they're both using the same, same edge provider. Um, so burrito.com becomes in the clear. And then the SNI says burrito.com in the clear. And then you get beans.com, and you see beans.com in the clear. You have basically four different points in which you're uh, saying explicitly to the network in clear text which sites you're going to. And what you'd, you'd like to have in, an, in a situation where you potentially have censorship or different adversaries, or you want to have some sort of privacy as to what websites you're going to, is you want to see if you can, as a website, hide in the crowd. Or as a person using a website, yeah, 
where's Waldo in this case? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so one of these proposals was, uh, was a few years ago um, called Meek, and this was kind of a, a well, it was, it was a temporary hack to solve this by uh, using an ambiguity in the HTTP spec. So the idea is you connect to burrito.com, and uh, then you'd make a TLS connection to burrito.com, and you know that beans.com is on the same provider, right? So you would send a request, an HTTP request for beans.com inside your burrito.com connection, and you'd get beans.com like this. So if you look from the network pr perspective, no one is accessing beans.com. You're only accessing burrito.com. So this this is a way to um, this is a way to use shared hosting providers or these edge services to to get around uh, get around censorship and. Uh, the problem with this is that there's no opt-in at all from the server side. So uh, just in the last couple months, uh, using something like this was, a, was an option on Google Cloud and on Amazon, and people started doing this, and uh, it got all of AWS blocked in Russia, for example, for, for, for a little bit of time. So, um, and and it, it, it takes burrito.com, and if they don't want to be used for beans.com, it puts them at pretty severe risk of being blocked in all sorts of countries in case beans are illegal for whatever reason. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a good idea, right? But it's, it's a hack. It uses the fact that the SNI and the host and the SAN, uh, the, the SAN is the, the name on the certificate for the host name, um, that they don't match, which there was no explicit prohibition of this in, in the spec, but it's kind of a, a, kind of a dangerous thing to do. So, um, let's talk about ways in which this could potentially actually actually work. Uh, what, well, HTTP one is what I had described before. HTTP two uh, slash two. I don't know why they, they did that. It's kind of you know style thing, I guess. Uh, but HTTP slash two, the next version of HTTP. I guess they didn't want any decimals. Um, is a, a pretty big enhancement to HTTP. But the the big difference is that. You have one TLS connection, and then you can send multiple HTTP connections over the encrypted channel. And they can be multiplexed. They can go in and out at different times. And this helps you optimize the speed of, of your site. In HTTP 1, you can send one request, one response, and then wait. One request, one response. What browsers would do is they'd make like five or six connections at once and start pipelining things. It was very inefficient. So HTTP 2 is the more efficient way of doing this. Um, and it comes with a very, very interesting feature called connection coalescing. And with connection coalescing, uh, if you connect to burrito.com and say get the burrito.com data, and then you connect to beans.com, and you see that beans.com has the same IP address or an overlapping set of IP addresses. It can be served by the same IP address. And uh, the certificate contains both the certificate for burrito.com also contains beans.com, then by default, browsers will just access beans.com through the existing TLS connection. So in terms of what's visible on the network here, the SNI for beans.com is gone, right? You still have beans.com in DNS, burrito.com twice in clear, but you know beans.com is no longer in SNI on the network. So this is, this is one particular thing that, that can uh, speed things up a little bit. Um, also, you don't have to make a second TLS connection to beans.com, so there's less back and forth. So latency is better, and you have this sort of marginal privacy gain. Now, more recently at the IETF, there's a new proposal called the Origin Frame, which enhances this even further. Um, essentially, it lets the server uh, claim ownership of different domains that are already on the certificate. So if you have burrito and beans.com on the certificate, you can send a frame that says, hey, beans.com is available here. Don't look it up on DNS. Don't bother. It's on my certificate. Trust me, it's here. So uh, in that case, you no longer will make the request to beans.com. And uh, you can kind of think of this like moving the DNS query into the tunnel in that it's not even a query at all. It's just sent from the server to the client. So this is also better for performance. There's fewer round trips. Um, Isn't this like, like, can't we attack this for DNS hijacking, right? You know, I could potentially advertise with whatever. Yeah, I'll, I'll get what this is. But basically, you, 
Yeah, so, so there are attacks that are a slightly different threat model in this case. Um, but in order to advertise Beans.com, you have to have possession of a certificate that is authoritative for Beans.com. So uh, if you haven't compromised the PKI, you can't hijack, no matter what you do to hijack DNS, you can't do anything with this. Yeah? So just a clarification, so this means now that the server, when it gets the second request, even before you get the origin thing, the second request for Beans.com, it needs to actually go like look at the TLS certificate and check that the get request uh, uh, host name matches what's in the common name of the cert? It doesn't have to. Uh, that, was the bug, that, that was the bug in Meek. Uh, yeah. So if you if if you can see if you consider that the bug in Meek is fixed, then yes, it would still apply. Um, but in this case, you probably want to check that Beans.com is on your certificate already before you send the origin frame. No, the client. But if the client wants to like do it for Tom.com instead, and you're not checking that. Oh yeah, the you, connection is like. Yeah. So the the question you is is. is match when you start like. Yeah. Do, you, do you still have to check the mismatch? And you do. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like something people you, are gonna get wrong. Every people are going to check check for mismatches in this case, but it's it's re it's really easy. You just you make a list of what cert what host names your certificate is valid for, and then if a, you just keep that state for connection state, right? So it's, yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's a it's a pretty short list. Um, yeah. Right, so uh, you can, typically these certificates only have about 20 to 40 names on them. Uh, so if you have a certificate with more than 20 or 40 names, you're gonna be actually causing network problems in that your, your <coughs> certificate is gonna span multiple TCP frames. So people like to make sure that these certificates are small. And if you can find a certificate that has over 100 names, um, that website's probably gonna be slow to load. So people typically don't do that. Um, so if you're connecting to, a to AWS, just to keep in mind here, this origin frame can only be sent for things that are on the certificate that you used in this connection. So if you're on AWS and I'm on AWS, I can't send your name as an origin frame because I don't have a certificate for your website, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, does this help with enumeration in terms of, uh, well, it helps make it much more explicit to the client whether or not they should do connection coalescing. Uh, it, it makes it so that the origin says, you know what, these are the things that I want you to connect for on this certificate. So you can actually use it to reduce the list as well if there's, say, strange routing conditions or something like that. That's right. Yeah, so the server in this case needs to have some sort of understanding of what the client's going to ask for next. So um, oftentimes, the, the, the best use case for this is for sub-resources on a web page. So if you, your burrito.com just has pictures from all sorts of different websites around the, the internet, um, it, it can know that beans.com is going to be on the, on the next request. So they can kind of preemptively push this and say, by the way, save some time when loading these images. Uh, Beans.com is available here. Yeah, so this is this is relatively new. Um, and looking here on what a network observer can see, uh, yeah, you you don't actually have Beans.com on the network anymore. That's actually that's a, a pretty big uh, gain, right? You have Burrito.com on the DNS and Burrito.com in the SNI. Uh, and so, as a network observer, you can see the first domain that you connect to, the first host name that you connect to. Um, and so your anonymity set kind of looks like this, is you have one client and then around 20 or so, as many as you can names as are fit on a certificate typically, is this the number of uh, potential sites that you're visiting if you're viewing this from a network. Um, so there's the shared IP and then if you connect to burrito.com, whatever certificate you get back, you can enumerate the names and that's your anonymity set. At least, at least from this perspective, in terms of what's plainly on the network, in terms of names. Yes? Burrito.com is still sent in the SNI. That's right. So, so it's whatever the first host name is, right? Burrito.com is on that certificate, so I'm considering it as a subset. Yeah? Here, uh, both 
Greater and Greens belong to the same person or organization? Is this really improving your anonymity set? Because you know, okay, you are connecting to this company, so. Right, so um, for example, Cloudflare does this with free customers. It just clumps a bunch of random people onto one certificate. And so this is, this is not the end game. There's several more slides. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it, it, it's a good point. Typically, you're going to have, you know, connect to Facebook and look at their, their certificate. You're going to have all sorts of Facebook properties, right? And so you're not anonymizing that you're going to Facebook.com versus Instagram, but you're, you know you're going to if one of the Facebook properties. So it's, it's not that great. So that's why it, it's around 20, but it, it helps make it less explicit. But um, yeah, you, it goes from there. But in any case, there's an, another new proposal at the IETF uh, called the certificate frame, which is really interesting and helps improve this quite a lot. Um, specifically, uh, when you send an origin frame, you can also send an additional certificate in the encrypted connection with a proof of ownership. And this proof of ownership is cryptographically bound to that connection. So uh, you take a value that's derived from the session key of this, this connection, it's called an exporter in TLS, and you sign that exporter um, with a certificate. You basically make something that's equivalent to the, the first flight from the server, and you, you use the second certificate for beans.com, and you put it inside here. So. Uh, from, from this perspective, the network, you still only see burrito.com, but then if you connect to burrito.com, it doesn't give you a hint as to which other sites that could have been used in this connection. It's, uh, it's up to the server to decide when to send which certificate for subsequent sites. So um, you don't have to know ahead of time which sites are going to co coalesce together. You can have sort of if you have like 100,000 sites on the same, same service, you can look at the site content, see what subdomains or what subresources are also managed by the same provider, and then push those certificates uh, right away at the same time as you push origin. Yeah. So what's the, what was the motivating application for this site? Uh, Just to like provide more performance improvements by like dumping more stuff in one connection? Yeah, basically it's to make sure that uh, the client doesn't have to make multiple TLS connections. It, it's, uh, it improves latency con considerably uh, from, this, from this perspective. So origin eliminates the extra DNS lookup and certificate makes it um, less likely that you need to make uh, d different connections. So it's, it, this is a performance improvement and it has a side effect that um, if you look from the outside, it just, it just looks like you're connecting to burrito.com from all the external identifiers or anything that's triggerable from the client, uh, this is what it looks like. So I hinted at some of the security issues with this. And uh, what it really changes, what origin and certificate changes, is that having a certificate now gives you some sort of routing authority. So um, in the very first case, without, without origin, to do connection coalescing, you had to have the same IP address for you to use both connections. Now, in this case, you don't. You just have to own a certificate. So if you are an attacker who's not necessarily on the path and able to modify DNS, then uh, you, can, you can potentially use this to hijack connections. So there, there's a slight downgrade in security for, from, this, from this perspective. But with things like uh, OCSP stapling to make sure that um, the client checks for revocation, and certificate transparency, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot. Basically, the risk is narrowed down to key compromise that is no long that is not discovered. So, if you can require that the client checks for revocation, and that every certificate is in certificate transparency, this doesn't really expand the the, the danger zone too much. So, uh, yeah. Any questions on this? This is a subtle point, but. Um, but potentially important. It, it's if DNS is unencrypted and, and unauthenticated, then you know how much security does that give you in terms of routing? Uh, the PKI is, PKI is much much stronger. So, looking looking back again at this at the anonymity set, you have uh, again w assuming one one for the client, but the server you have a shared IP and the first host name, and K is the set of domains on certificates that can be obtained through the first host name. So if you connect to burrito.com, 
at as many names as the server can think of to send you that can preempt you um, from going to next is the anonymity set. So uh, how, uh, th this was brought up earlier as a question, but how does the server choose, how does the server know which certificate to send ahead of time? Um, in the website case, you can look at the website content and see what the sub-references are. But you could also potentially think of this as a way to do meek-like uh, censorship circumvention. So you could only send the certificate frame on certain secret sub-pages. Sub uh, so you could have like burrito.com slash secretly I want to go to beans.com and only share that with uh, several of your activist friends. And then at, if you go to that specific URL, then the server would send the beans.com certificate. So that would maybe, maybe make it more difficult for sensors to understand which certificates are being used uh, at the same time as other, as other certificates. So it, it, this adds a, another sort of hidden element uh, in terms of where the certificate frame can be uh, utilized. So again, another subtle point. So we have all this like fancy constructions inside of HTTP, and then DNS is just laying out there unencrypted, and we're, it's uh, it's in just a very sad and sorry state. Sorry state. And uh, looking kind of more closely, what really happens behind behind the fact, uh, if you have a cache miss from your resolver, then the resolver goes to uh, the root server and says, hey, do you know where to find this? And it says, well, you know what? I know where .com is. Maybe you can ask .com. And then so you say, OK, .com, do you know where this is? And they're like, well, I know where we is. We.com is down there. So go talk to them. And each one of these cases, by default, um, this resolver sends to the root server what's called the client subnet, which is in IPv4 uh, situations, it's the first three numbers. They just sort of X out the last byte of the IP address. So this is really like leaking the client address all over the place and all these, all these responses are in the clear. So this is, uh, this is a pretty easy way to associate a client or at least you know, a set of 256 clients to uh, a given DNS query. So um, caching somewhat helps with that. You know, it helps protect this. But, um, but there's, there's several other new technologies that, that have recently been released to help minimize this risk. Uh, one of which is just don't send client subnet. Client subnet is used for some situations if you want to do geo load balancing and you're using different IPs in different locations. Uh, nowadays, a lot of edge services use the same IP in different locations, so it's not really that useful. Um, it has some uses, but for, if you want to be privacy preserving, get rid of that client subnet. So then all these requests don't tie into, uh, tie the client with the, with the server. Um, another thing is uh, something called queue name minimization. Uh, when you're asking the root server, you don't have to give the whole name of the domain. You might as well just say where's .com because that's the only the only label I need. And same with the TLD server. So there's a couple ways to kind of help this on the back end. But the really most most important part for DNS and the most most important part for most people using the internet is between the client and the first network component that you run into the resolver, right? So this is plain text, this is in UDP, this is completely uh, circumventable. I'm not gonna go into DNSSEC, uh, which is uh, a way to add authentication to DNS, but it adds nothing in terms of confidentiality. So we'll, we'll just pretend that doesn't exist for now. Um, but it's, it's a cool technology, it is being deployed. This one, for example, is being deployed much more widely, much more quickly. It's called uh, DOE, or DNS over HTTPS, kind of an unfortunate name. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is that you set up an HTTPS connection, a TLS connection, with uh, the resolver, and then uh, you have this really nice multiplexing functionality that HTTP2 gives you, and you can send DNS queries as HTTP2 frames. So set up an HTTPS connection, send your DNS queries, basically serialize the DNS wire format, put it into a frame, send it on the wire. And this is what DNS over HTTPS is. There's other proposals like DNS over TLS and uh, DNS curve, but DNS over HTTPS is, uh, in my opinion, the most elegant and also one that lets you solve one of the difficult problems, which is um, taking DNS out of the operating system and moving it into the application. Um, uh, upgrading operating systems are hard and you know, relying on DNS 
the operating system relies on DNS for everything. So if you have a browser, the browser does HTTP, you might as well just do DNS inside the browser. That's, that's how Doe is going. Um, so in any case, you, have, you end up with something like this, where this, is, this first connection right there is locked, client subnet no longer sent, queue name minimization. You have quite a few, and, and these things are just happening in the last couple of years or so. Um, DOH, for example, isn't even finished standardization. Um, but yeah, it's being deployed. Okay, so we've been talking about security and privacy. The other half is latency. It, it, does, this, does this hurt latency? It, it's gonna hurt latency a bit. How much is it really gonna do it hurt latency? So just taking a step back um, and say you have an ISP that does your DNS, uh, it's closer to the user, most likely. It's gonna be closer than most uh, DNS providers, and even if they're very widely geographically distributed. Um, but often they have a small cache. I don't know if anyone's ever done DNS testing with their, their local ISP, but they don't, you typically have shared caches and, um, and, and you know, this is, it's UDP, it's plain text, and uh, ISPs also, at least there was a, a recent law passed in the US that, that they're allowed to monetize this data. And so, uh, you know, people trust their ISPs in Europe more than in the US, but uh, <laughs> in any case, it's, it, it, is, it is somewhat of a risk, right? Um, uh, and for latency-wise, it's okay, but oftentimes you're gonna miss the cache. Uh, if you have an edge provider that gives you DNS over HTTPS, it's also globally distributed. You can get requests rather quickly with uh, a new feature of TLS 1.3, which is the zero round trip mode. So um, you lose some latency, but on the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. Um, there are some challenges in the enterprise. If you're talking about encrypting DNS, DNS is used for forensics, it's used for incident response, it's used for all sorts of things of like, what's happening on my network? This, yeah, you, you lose that. Um, if you are running, if you're, if you're in an enterprise and you really need this visibility and your clients are using DNS over HTTPS, you can set up a DNS over HTTPS proxy and you know, look at the traffic that way, but you lose some debugging tools. So this is, this is one of the controversies around DNS over HTTPS, but in any case, uh, it is commonly being deployed. Uh, for example, um, Firefox has now DOH native in, uh, in the latest version of Firefox. So you can go into the config panel, put in a DNS or HTTPS server, and just start using it. And, um, and yeah, so I think, this is, I think it's in Firefox nightly. It might even be, be in the stable version of Firefox. Uh, so anyways, this is happening. So how does this change our overall picture with uh, certificate frame and origin frame and everything like this? Well, um, it basically encrypts the burrito.com hosting, right? So you go to resolver.com and uh, request burrito, and then burrito.com is there in the, um, only in the SNI. That's the only clear text identifier for what website you're going to that's left. Um, so how do we fix this? Is there a way to fix this? Is it possible? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and this is something that's been talked about for a very long time, SNI encryption. Um, the idea is really simple, right? Uh, the website posts somewhere public, in particular DNS, a, say, Diffie-Hellman chair, a, short, a, a medium term key that's static. And uh, you mix that with the client ephemeral key, and then you encrypt the uh, SNI, and, you, in, and the server then can decrypt that and use it to choose which certificate to serve. Um, and it kind of, kind of looks like this, right? So you have the DNS resolver, uh, you get a public key back, um, and then you use that to encrypt uh, burrito.com. And the, the reason this wasn't, it, this isn't really necessarily possible without encrypting DNS, because this public key could be modified, uh, this public key could be changed to something that an attacker can figure out. Uh, and also, it's typically, it's gonna be a text record in DNS which doesn't have super great reliability and availability through the system to, the, to uh, different applications. So DOH, DO, enables encrypted SNI. And with TLS 1.3, um, the server, the certificate sent from the server, is encrypted in the handshake. So uh, even if you were to replay as an attacker this encrypted SNI, what you'd get back, uh, as long as this is something that's only done over TLS 1.3, is the certificate, is 
at the encrypted certificate. If it was TLS 1.2, you could send encrypted SNI and then it would give you the certificate back, which would reduce the, the, the scope of what possible sites it is. And in this case, you don't even see anything. So um, first host name gone. Client unique IP, shared server IP. That's what you see. Your anonymity set now is K. Yeah. Sure. I mean, there, there's different ways to encapsulate it, but it's it it just has to be, it has to contain a public key. In any case, and there's no there's no Diffie-Hellman certificates nowadays. Is one reason, at least not in in the PKI. Uh, so it, it's kind of tricky. You can, um, but then this public key, because it's not authenticated, uh, could be manipulated by the attacker to a key that they know, and then they would be able to decrypt the the SNI in this case and, and figure it out. And but but mostly it has to do with reliability of DNS. In this case, you have a very reliable channel between the browser and a resolver that. If it supports DOH, it's likely going to do the right thing in terms of being able to support text records. Make sense? Good. Good, good, good. OK, so um, <laughs> there's another caveat. This is just a rabbit hole, right? Uh, anonymizing things uh, on the network is very difficult. Uh, I haven't even gotten to website fingerprinting. I'm not probably not going to. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, if the server IP is static, for example, um, then you actually have a hint about what the first host name is going to be. So um, if you do ES and I, like if you're finding out what burrito.com is, and it always returns the same answer, then you could potentially infer that the first connection is to burrito.com and get back to the last case. So. Um, the, whatever the entry point is to, to this uh, should, should likely be more randomized in terms of DNS. People don't do this. That's just just another thing is, is uh, if you have static sets of things, people can derive more information about it. But uh, generally speaking, K is the number <coughs> set of domains that can be served on the IP. It's very hard to know uh, which one somebody is connecting. You're, you essentially have a, a connection where everything is going through. So I mentioned, like, how do you know what certificates to send ahead of time? If you have, you know, like in this case, you have all of Google Cloud is doing this, and you have 200,000 sites. You can't just send 200,000 certificate frames right away. That would just congest the, the traffic. It, you have to know where people are going ahead of time. So one interesting neat trick is if your edge provider is the same entity as your DNS provider, you can do some fun stuff, specifically uh, what I'm calling the DOH VPN. So <laughs> you connect to resolver.com. Resolver.com can serve you traffic. It, say it's the same same provider. So you ask for beans.com, and uh, it says, oh, OK, this is a DNS query for beans.com. I bet they're going to try to connect to beans.com next. So I'm just going to send a certificate in origin frame for beans.com, and then you can get it. So in this case, the only thing you see on the network is resolver.com and sort of nothing else. Right, So you have the same anonymity set, and you don't have a dynamic IP requirement. The only IP that's seen on the network is the resolver's IP. And, uh, and voila, you're done, right? <laughs> well, so not really. But, um, but this, is, this is sort of an, an extension of how far you can go with these overlapping technologies that you can layer on top of each other. So yep. curious, does this happen in your life today? Not yet. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is something that could happen. <laughs> like basically decentralizing much more in particular cloud uh, you know, edge providers this information, which actually like, in some sense is a privacy step backwards because if they're cooperating with governments to reveal right. that information, then uh, you're just centralizing all that information for them. Yeah, I'm going like, to bring up that discussion okay. soon because okay. it's an important point. Um, and it's, it's also not particularly clear that that's, that's how much of a step backwards it, sure. it is. Because it's already so centralized. Right. So um, these technologies, where are we now? What, what, what stage of maturity are any of these things? Well, Origin is implemented by Firefox. It's on, almost going to be standardized. Certificate is in discussions for being standardized. Doe is 
Uh, already supported by Google DNS and Cloudflare's DNS service, which is 1.1.1.1. And uh, encrypted SNI, it's be being discussed as well, but it's, it's not, a, not even a formal proposal. This is, this is really a future looking thing. So if I come back in, again in two years, my hope is that all this will be deployed in real. Um, but right now, we're, we're not there. So yeah, origin. If you just break it down by privacy, latency, and security, it's um, improvement. It's limited by you know how many things you can put on a certificate. Uh, latency, it's better. You skip HTTPS and DNS and extra HTTPS. Security, you know, there's an additional risk if you compromise a certificate. Certificate, you know, you can hide any bean in any burrito. It's great, right? Um, uh, latency. Uh, this extends the benefit of origin um, and security. You know, you're exchanging. DNS as your kind of second factor for authentication of the, of the certificate to, for something like certificate transparency and OCSP stapling. So slight security downgrade. Um, DOH, you know, it has a slight first hop improvement. Um, latency depends on the provider and TLS 1.3, but it does provide security against attacks and uh, you can still do some passive DNS if you're in an enterprise, uh, as long as you set up a proxy. Um, Encrypted SNI, uh, first domain privacy, so the first domain that you connect to on a site that uses coalescing, it gives you this type of privacy and, and mostly removes SNI from, uh, from the plain text. Um, depends on DOE for reliability uh, and uh, there is risk, there is some sort of ecosystem risk with this where um, right now there's these man in the middle proxies that will selectively choose to man in the middle these are corporate inspection proxies say you work at a big corporation and they want to make sure that you're not browsing facebook uh they have these things that look at the tls connections as they go by if they know what and they use sni for this so they say if it has a specific sni then you know crack open the connection um you as a corporate employee have installed this like man in the middle root on trusted root on your computer if if ESNI becomes pervasive, then there, there is a risk that they just start cracking open every connection because they don't know which one's Facebook, which one's not. So uh, th there's a potential ecosystem risk for this. Um, so when it comes to open questions, there are a bunch of open questions, and this is where we can get into the discussion. Uh, first, I didn't really talk about this too much, but this is really only about removing plain text literals from the network. It does nothing for obfuscating which, how the website loads and what sub-resources are there, or how you can actually fingerprint what it looks like when someone's browsing the web. Uh, side channels, leak information, this does not help with this at all. Um, so removing explicit signals does not you know, protect you from passive signals or implicit ones. Um, this is the, the point that Tom raised is consolidation. You know, um, what this really does is, so the web is moving to a lot of different services being the centralized points in which people connect to the internet. And uh, this is moving fast whether or not these things exist. In fact, these things don't exist, right? So it's, it's not really contributing. But this does provide additional um, performance benefits for websites if they want to use a service that's also used by a lot of other people. So it's, it leads somewhat of a competitive advantage to big networks that already have a lot of centralization. So uh, the question here is, is how much worse does this make it, right? You already get a lot of benefits for using these sort of widely distributed edge networks. Do you get additional, I mean, are people gonna choose to use that because of these features and then thus lead to a slightly more centralized web? That's an open question and an important one because uh, the de decentralized nature, the fact that there are so many different providers that are s so different, providing different features on the internet is well, part of... Like people? Like people are the providers? Yeah. The uh, people who are, are people who are running websites, people who are running web services. Um, because people don't have much choice. As a user, we don't have much choice. Right. Yeah, I, choice. I mean... As providers, they have half a choice because they use whatever they can pay for. I mean, I consider every person to be a web service provider, right? I mean, every person has a presence online. Every person can choose to have a Facebook page or a personal web page. So I think that 
I, I mean, when I, when I consider users, I, users as in people that can view the internet, and then people as in like human beings broadcasting their identity to the world. So uh, that, that's when I talk about when, when folks who have, are running web services have a choice. Uh, do they want to use a consolidated network to serve their website? Or uh, if you're a corporation and you will have a, have to have a choice, um, you know, where's the balance? Is this going to tip the balance towards a more centralized world? Maybe yes. Is that a bad thing? Maybe. Um, so I, I don't know. So is, is, the, uh, is the benefit for privacy overall counteract, counteractive to that and, and a bigger gain for the world? Also hard to tell. So this is, this is a nice open question, something to talk about over drinks. Uh, and uh, there are different opinions all over on this case. And um, the other one is, you know, is visibility into what people are doing, users are doing online, tracking the connection between users and website. Is this, is this actually necessary in some cases? Uh, you talk to the, your traditional security providers and they're saying, we need to look at malware, we need to look at spam, we need to look at malicious actors on a network, we need as much visibility as we possibly can to make sure that people inside networks are safe. So, um, yeah, this is my last slide. Okay. So, <laughs> in any case, uh, so, you know, is, is this idea of safety online more important than security or privacy? These things interplay in very complex ways. So, um, Given that kind of sour note, uh, I, I, did, I wanted to temper the enthusiasm for this idea, but, uh, but I think it, it, it's, it is a really good idea, and the, the web is changing kind of underneath everyone's feet without them, without people really knowing about these underlying protocols. So the hope is that um, with this presentation and, and with some of this work that we can, you know, add some additional privacy and also improve performance for the internet. And, uh, and make sure that people actually know what's happening. So with that, um, thanks for the attention. <laughs>